you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Thank you very much for attending. As I was presented, I am work at the Unicentro University and I work with immunology in Catalan. We have some partnership with ICC, working with Rumen Gist, and now I'm going to talk a little about our results. The next slide, please. I don't have... Well, to start talking about this, it's good to review immunology so that these, each of these steps will be better understood. What we have to keep in mind is that, that we are always exposure to pathogens. Many people in this room, air conditioning on, there is no air circulation, so we are breathing pathogens. They can be virus, fungi, parasites, bacteria, and this, what prevents us from becoming sick is our immune system because we have physical barriers as the skin and the mucosa preventing the entrance. But if it penetrates in the tissue, it will be, he will be met by the innate immune system or the adaptive immune system. It is more efficient, but it takes a little longer to become active. If the organism is able to invade the tissues, the innate immune system with cell and humoral components will try in a non-specific manner, not considering the type of the pathogens, destroy them by phagocytosis. Melina talked about this. We have the dendritic cells and the macrophages that belong to the tissue and recognize it immediately. And if necessary, they will call cell from the blood, namely neutrophils. And this humoral com component that is related to the complement, coagulation system, and cytokines. All of this will activate the adaptive immune system also with the cell and humoral co components that will take longer time to set up the response, but it is more effective, more efficient in the elimination of pathogens from five to seven days. Why this response is set up? If the innate immunity is not able to fight the agents, the adaptive immunity will start to be active. And then we have lymphocytes and antibodies. As I said, the first uh, tissue are the dendritic cells and the macrophages that will involve the pathogen. From this moment on, they will start to try to eliminate them and communicate with other blood cells, neutrophils and lymphocytes. This, the elimination of these pathogens will happen with a microbicide activity. When you digest these microorganisms that were phagocyto underwent phagocytosis, we have myelopyroxidase, super dismutase superoxide, and also the reactive oxygen species. In this cascade of interactions, we have the release of free radicals. And you, oxygen oxidate, and they will perforate this microorganism in an attempt to destroy them. And then it's important to have two concepts. They are very easy to have a confusion. One is the oxidative metabolism and the oxidative stress. The first one is good. The more ROS I produce within the cell, the higher will be its ability to eliminate the pathogens. But when this is produced in a large amount, this will move out of the cell and then it can destroy cells that are healthy. So therefore, most cells have an antioxidant system made up by enzymes that will degrade the ROS, glutathione peroxidase and superoxide dismutase. They also have vitamins, zinc, selenium, and they are considered to be immune nutrients. This system has a certain capability 
And when it goes beyond it, the ROS will move out of the cell and will destroy the healthy cells. So this would be an exaggerated destruction of the, the tissue. We will have longer time to heal. So this can be very damaging. That's why we are always concerned about free radicals. A small amount is good when excessive, this can be harmful. All of this must be very well regulated, very well balanced. And that is why we have inflammatory mediators that will ensure that the immune response will be efficient, eliminating the pathogen, but not to destroy the healthy tissue. And this is mediated by inflammatory mediators that are produced when the inflammation is severe. The earliest one are the acute phase proteins. In the when we talk about cattle, aptoglobin and amyloid, a amyloid ser serum. This will help to produce the inflammatory cytokines, the chemokines that will act between the two and the result will be the inflammation. And here we have a healthy tissue. And when inflammation starts, cells from the blood will migrate into the tissue. The higher the inflammation means I produce more acute phase protein. And if this is exaggerated, it can be harmful to the host. So the excess of acute phase protein avoids the super inflammation and maintains viable pathogens inside the tissue. So infection will be perpetuated. And this can make the clinical systems persist for a longer time or the severity of the disease will be increased. And one of the indicators of inflammations are the leukocytes. If they have to migrate to the infected tissue, they have to be increased first in the blood. If they increase in the blood, they can migrate into the tissue. In a less severe lesion, they will increase in the blood and then they will go to the tissue. When the inflammation is very severe, they will migrate faster to the tissue than they increase in the blood. So the increase of leukocytes and uh, or a decrease of neutrophils. And this concept is very easy, but it's not applicable to cattle. They have a high influence of stress and stress increase the amount of leukocytes and neutrophils, and they are not able to leave the blood stream to go to tissue. So the leukogram will not tell us if the animal has an infection or not, but he doesn't have a number of good cells, active cells able to fight against infection. When this immune reaction takes place in the tissue, this started with a macrophage that identified the pathogen that called the macrophages. They reached the lymph node to start the adaptive immune response. In this adaptive immune response, this will take from five to seven days. During this period, this is when the lymphocytes start differentiating to have a more specific response against the pathogen. If these pathogens are inside the cell, a virus, for example, or if it's a cell that was produced in deficiency, like cancer cells, the destruction will be performed by cytotoxic lymphocyte. will destroy these cells that are the lymphocyte CD8. If they are extracellular, like antigens, parasites, or even bacteria that outside the cells, the response is mediated by antibodies. So the lymphocyte has to be differentiated into lymphocyte B or plasma, plasma cell, and then we will set up the antibodies against the disease. 
All of this will depend on the type of infection we are dealing with. If this animal had an infection, the first minutes we had the innate immune response and at the same time started activating the cells, the lymphocytes of the adaptive immune response, five to seven days. During this period, we need antibody formation. The antibodies will eliminate the pathogen. But if the innate system was able to eliminate the pathogen, we will have memory cells. They will be stored. When this agent is again, again present, it will take three days to produce an antibody. So we'll shorten the response. All of this is important, but there is a balance for the immune system to work in the best manner possible. The balance of the disease is correlated with the amount of the infectious agent, its virulence and its immunity capability. So we are all here in a closed room. We have viruses everywhere, but we received better glucans during the coffee break. So no one is going to be sick. At the same time, we cannot have an hyperinflammation. So we need to have a balance between the, the inflammatory mediators and the anti-inflammatory response. So we will not cause damages to the host. Based on this, we can ensure that we will have health. But depending on this production system, we submit these animals to challenges that affect immunity and this balance will no longer exist. The, uh, the systems that provide more stress are during the feedlot, when these animals are fed until weaning, or dairy cows during the perturbation period. So we are going now to talk about each one of them and the challenges we have to face. As to feedlot, the feedlot is considered to be the main cause of respiratory, bovine respiratory disease and supercute ruminal acidosis. And they are caused by the stress, this change in the environment where the animals are maintained. And how all of this happens, let's remember how the respiratory system defenses work. In the respiratory tract, we have an aerodynamic filtration, decreasing the size of the respiratory pathway from the nerves to the lung. In the trachea, what is inhaled that we are able to move past these defenses, they will get caught in the mucociliary system. The cells have cilia and they have mucus and any substance that is inhaled will be stuck on the mucus and then it will be swall swallowed or it will be expectorated. When they reach the alveoli, we have the innate immune system, the epithelial cells, the macrophages, they will communicate with the blood, and then we will have the immunoglobulins being produced. In a feedlot, we have challenges related to transportation, environment. They come from pasture to a closed environment, a large number of animals, and they are competing for the space, for the feed, for the water. And the diet is also modified to become more productive. And all of this will affect this mucociliary system. This mucus become thicker. And as a consequence, the cilia are not able to, to move the pathogens into the mouth. And this is the time when viruses that are present in every feedlot, like the bovine viral diarrhea, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, the respiratory syncytial virus, they will cause disease in the respiratory system that usually is not severe. But here, the viruses 
decrease the activity of the macrophages, of the lymphocytes and, and bacteria that are present here, they will reach the lung that has no defense and will cause pneumonia. Pasteurella, manhemia, and histophilus. And worldwide, they are the main causes of disease. It's not an excessive number of bacteria in the environment. It's not a single pathogenic bacteria, but the immunity of the animal that was decreased and favored the disease. For these systems to be effective, the feedlot needs to have a diet with more energy, more than 60% of grains. And this will cause insults in the rumen. So we have the subacute ruminal acidosis, then we have small decreases in the rumen pH, and this will cause insults to the papillae. It will burn the rumen's wall and the, but the bacteria will penetrate, then we will have an infiltration of lymphocyte. As a consequence, they increase in a process that we call parakeratosis. To protect itself, it will increase the keratin layer so that more bacteria from the rumen, rumen will not penetrate in the papilla but this will decrease the, the absorption of volatile fatty acids. While all of this is going on, I elicited the immune response and I have an increase of aptoglobins and inflammatory mediators say that in order to not hurt the rumen, we will have an immune response. Then the phagocytes, have a reduction of their activity as they have moved to the room. And so the animal is susceptible to respiratory disease. Stress in the first 30 days of feedlot and then serum afterwards in the feedlot. And what? So what? The respiratory disease is one that causes one of the highest losses worldwide. Should we use sodium monenzin, there are some restrictions because it can cause bacterial resistance. Antibiotics, they are widely used, metaphylaxis, where we have a dose of antibiotics. When the animal comes to the feedlot, the problem is that the single dose induces bacterial resistance. We can give vaccines against respiratory diseases, excellent, but it takes 21 days to start the antibody production. Will we have this time before the animals come to the feedlot? And another concept is the use of immunomodulation by itself or with the other items. This will depend on the challenge that this animal is exposed. The higher the challenge, the higher the immune response of this animal. Well, knowing all of this, we ICC presented the proposal of testing the immune modulating effects in the feedlot by supplementing with rumen yeast, is authorized rich in cell wall yeast, and if this improved immune innate immune response could reduce the incidence of BRD, bovine respiratory disease. We used 36 animals uh, transported for a short distance, two animals per pen, so low level of challenge, and they received a highly concentrated diet we divided in three groups, one control, one received four grams per day of rumen yeast, and the other group seven grams. After acclimation period of seven days to fight stress of moving the animals, on day zero, we provided the diet, 50% corn silage and concentrate, and we started 
switching to the diet with 60% concentrate. So this acclimation was thought to be as least stressing as possible. We collected samples on day zero, day 14, and final days of finishing 105 days and on day 106, the animals were slaughtered. So we measured the intracellular ROS production, aptoglobin, which is inflammation marker, and the indicators of bovine respiratory disease. So differences were seen from day 42 on. So we see that according to our trial and according to the literature, we know we see the effects of yeast and ruminants starting at 30 days of supplementation. Rumen yeast, four grams, always had the best results as to reactive oxygen species and rumen yeast seven, we saw the effect on day 70 and then it disappeared. So it makes no sense because a higher dose of yeast would have less effects than the lower dose because there's no issue with toxicity. And on day 105, all groups had reduced levels of reactive oxygen species. And this was the moment where there was uh, cold stress, the animals were stressed and immunity was affected. And this last day of finishing, we know that climate changes may happen. It's impossible to control weather. So these stresses may appear at any point in time. As the response to seven grams of yeast, we measure serum haptoglobin levels and that group receiving seven grams already had higher levels than the other groups, even before we started seeing the effects of the yeast. So the animals started the trial and they were already sick. After the effect was gone, we saw that the group receiving four grams of yeast had lower inflammatory indicators uh, while the control group and the seven gram yeast group also had higher levels. So we imagined the bovine respiratory disease already happens in the first days of, in the feedlot. So the, it was possible that the animals were already sick on day zero and more specifically on day 14, we had a higher incidence of Na nasal discharge in those animals. The symptoms disappeared, however, reappeared with the cold stress. On the, the animals were slaughtered. We saw pneumonia, especially in the cranial ventral lobe, pneumonia was not affecting the whole lung, just located in the small region. And we can classify the pneumonia according to the score. Score one, healthy animal. Score two, 50%. Score three, 75%. In this feedlot, no animals were considered to be score four. So, here we saw that rumen is four grams. We had a higher number of healthy animals while control and seven grams, we saw the same incidence of pneumonia. However, from day zero to day 14, we already had five animals that were already, with, they had pneumonia, they were treated with antibiotics as well as two animals from the control group. 
other five animals from the control group also showed clinical signs of the disease, three in the rumen yeast four, and two uh, from the group of rumen yeast seven grams. So the groups were not, when we compared the healthy animals from the control four and seven grams group, group they had the same behavior. However, it's difficult to compare animals that were already sick. So the first conclusion was four grams of yeast improved the phagocytic activity. Yeast seven grams had intermediate action on immunity, but more animals were sick. And after this stress, control and rumen E7 gram had the same percentage of bovine respiratory disease. What about comparing just the healthy animals? The disease affected weight gain, similar results as the weight gain, feed conversion rate and weight gain was better in the group receiving four grams and the group receiving seven grams had the intermediate response as to weight gain and feed conversion rate because of the higher number of animals that were already sick. We reanalyzed the data, trying to analyze only the healthy animals. And by removing the sick animals, we see exact the same re immune response. So those animals that were sick reduced the performance of the whole group. So the severity of pneumonia and diagnosis of pneumonia between the control group and room in East 4 and 7 was lower in the treated groups because we had a better immunity and healthier animals. And we can also conclude that the sick animals that were sick along the trial. However, the yeast improved their conditions, considering that just two animals from the seven gram uh, yeast group uh, showed clinical signs of the disease. We also mentioned that yeast can modulate the gut as well. Dr. Melina mentioned that through moss, we, we can have prevention of the entry of pathogenic bacteria by binding to the fimbria and by reducing the incidence of diarrhea. This might be important for carcass quality and meat quality, increasing the safety for humans. So the next question to be answered was rumen ease can reduce the excretion, the fecal excretion of, path of pathogens and uh, how this uh, can affect carcass contamination. At the end of the trial, we check the contamination levels in the environment of the animals. Although the animals received different treatments, control four and seven grams of rumen yeast. The environment was contaminated because of water contamination. The pens were side by side. Animals, animals were excreting the contamination into the environment. And this resulted in higher contamination of the height of the animals in all groups without any statistical significance. So environmental contamination results in contamination of the height that in turn could affect the microbiological contamination of the carcass. So fecal microbiota, we had a reduced production of E. coli from day 20 to day 105, and fecal coliforms, same idea. All three groups showed a reduction in contamination by fecal coliforms. However, these reductions were more significant the group receiving higher levels of yeast. And carcass contamination, 
both groups, treatment groups, four and seven grams, showed a reduction of fecal contamination of the carcass. E. e. coli, mesophils, and, and total coliforms uh, was reduced. So by reducing fecal excretion of bacteria, we have a lower translocation contamination of the carcass with a production of better quality meat, longer shelf life. All the values are within the regulatory values. However, it's obvious if we reduce the microbiological contamination of the carcass, we have extended shelf life of the product. The second trial was with CAMPs, other challenges that also affect the immune system. We know that these CAMPs are born with an image immature immune system, they uh, they are highly dependent on colostrum intake. At 30 days of age, the maternal immunity is, starts decaying and their own antibodies are produced from 90 days of age on. So we have an immune window and also the calves are challenged by the environment and cleaner environment, they are able to better control the number of pathogens, the calves are healthier, and when they are exposed to dirty environment, the challenge level is higher. So the quality of the calf facilities is crucial, and if they have diseases in this period with in the first days of life, up to 90 days of age, the most common diseases are diarrhea, pneumonia, or pneumoenteritis, association of pneumonia and diarrhea. So we conducted the trial using rumen yeast and calves. They were naturally infected by imeria, by coccidia. So we conducted uh, this trial in a commercial farm in Paraná. The animals were kept in individual huts. And as you can see in the picture, was a sand uh, litter, sand with wood shavings and with coccidia, it was impossible to disinfect the facilities because of the wood and of the type of lit litter. I mean, it's a coccidiosis that is usually asymptomatic. However, in immunologically immature uh, animals, this might result in a bloody diarrhea with high morbidity and high mortality. When we arrived at the dairy farm, the animals were already uh, contaminated we the trial was conducted with 20 hosting heifers 15 days of life proper colostrum intake five with diarrhea five without diarrhea in the control group and the same in the treated group so the first day of the trial five in each group had diarrhea we started supplementing the treatment group with rumen yeast, 10 grams per day, according to the manufacturer's recommendations. And we also challenge these animals with intranasal BRD vaccine at, um, 50, with 30 days of age. So we assess the animals every day, wait, they, they will wait every week and for immunity, we tried to measure immunity after the vaccination on three days after vaccination, seven days later, 33, 36 and 51 days of age. So we measured serum 
IgG, uh, immunoglobulins, production of reactive oxygen species, species and the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. So we provide the yeast dissolved in the milk. We try to ensure that the animals from the treatment group receive the supplementation. And when they were 30 days of age, they received the intranasal vaccine. This vaccine is recommended to be used in calves starting at three days of age, but this can be used as a model of a mild respiratory viral disease. So we know that after giving the vaccine and assessing the respiratory system, although we have increased production of IgA, we, IgA, we also have an irritation of the nasal pharynx and this triggers the humoral response because the vaccine contains the modified live virus, the essential respiratory bovino, herpes virus, and viral influenza 3, mimicking a mild viral infection. When the animals are vaccinated intranasally, we have depressed cell response, however, increased humoral response. The first seven days after the vaccine, we have reduction of the production of reactive oxygen species by the bronchoalveolar macrophages, and we have a migration of neutrophils from the blood to the respiratory system. If the calves are healthy, this depression of the immunity followed by increased humoral response would not cause disease, but our calves were not healthy. They had diarrhea and they were in our trial, these calves were still uh, 30 days of age within the immunological window. So this trial tried to assess if supplementation improved diarrhea or not. So we considered diarrhea with a fecal score of two or three. We measured the number of diarrhea episodes if the animal had diarrhea, discontinued for five days. If they had an episode, improved for three days and had another diarrhea, this was considered to be two episodes. So the control group had more diarrhea episodes than the supplemented group with 15 days. Uh, the experimental period, the animals had no imeria in the feces. Feces, however, we know imeria destroys the intestinal villi. And in the uh, treated group, this was better control. And we also measured the duration of diarrhea. Diarrhea lasted from five to 14 days in the supplemented group and for longer period in this control group, three weeks or more. So besides a higher number of episodes, the diarrhea lasted longer. We also measured the fecal score every day. We transformed the data in median for the week during diarrhea was more frequent up to the third week of the experimental period. The treated group had a firmer fecal matter when compared to the control group. And then uh, the situation improved as a whole in all groups. As to pneumonia, we assessed rectal temperature, presence of cough and nasal discharge. We added the scores and the animals could be considered uh, healthy with a score of zero up to nine with a 
very severe. Uh, so fever, repeated cough, and significant nasal discharge. So whenever the animals had a score of four or higher, we inspected the respiratory system, allowing us to differentiate if the condition was related to the vaccine effect and upper respiratory uh, condition or pneumonia. So whenever the animal had fever for at least three days and the respiratory sound at the auscultation showed that the animal was healthy. So based on that, during the first week, no animals had BRD. The second uh, week one animal in the control group had pneumonia and 30 days of life immediately after vaccination all animals had some respiratory manifestation so score of four or higher edibles were clinically examined five animals of the control group had pneumonia compared to one in the treated group. These animals were followed along the trial. And we know this pneumonia lasts for 10 to 15 days. So some pneumonias cannot be detected at clinical examination. This is why we decided to measure serum haptoglobin. Day zero, when the calves were 15 days of age, both groups had high inflammation levels, high haptoglobin content, normal up to 10, higher than 10 is indicative of inflammation. And usually the higher haptoglobin, the more severe the condition. So three days after vaccination, the control group still had high levels of inflammation while the treated group saw a reduction in haptoglobin. However, we don't know if high haptoglobin levels are caused by diarrhea or pneumonia. So disease affected weight gain because started in the, from the third week of the experimental period, this, treated group had a better performance and the control group because of diarrhea, pneumonia, and less intestinal absorption. We know that yeast promotes the growth of the villi and promoting absorption of nutrients. Just one animal in the control group refused the milk for two days. The other animals maintained the intake. One animal was, was dehydrated in each one of the groups because of fever or pneumonia or diarrhea. But these signs were not very significant. Our team was there at the farm paying attention to all signs. The moment we identify 5% dehydration, the animals were orally hydrated dehydration was corrected, the, uh, the animal needed IV hydration, the others were just supplemented orally. If so, both conditions, health conditions affected weight gain and we wanted to check if the treatment was improving the immunity of the animals. We measured reactive oxygen species and the ratio of neutrophil to lymphocytes. So three days after vaccine, the control group showed a reduction in reactive oxygen species, probably because of the disease and the vaccine as immunity was reduced, they developed respiratory disease. This was also seen in the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. They had similar ratios during the first week of life. However, as the animals 
became sicker, uh, pneumonia or higher level of nasopharyngeal irritation, they had lower levels of neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So they had to increase the number of neutrophils trying to fight the infection in the gut or in the respiratory system. And this was statistically significant, higher in the control group and the trend to, towards statistical significance in the treated group with time, we saw that the control group, seven animals had higher levels of neutrophils when compared to lymphocytes and three had l normal levels. So highly discrepant data. So although the medians are different, we don't see statistical difference. As to immune globulins, we saw that after vaccination, serum IgG production has, was not increased, but Melina already explained nasal simulation of vaccines will not induce systemic immune globulins as IgG. However, they induce, uh, they trigger mucosal immunity expressed as IgA. So we saw a difference between the treated and control group as to IgG, but not within the experimental period after 21 days. And we have also seen increased production of IgA, both during the initial experimental period and also related to the treatment. The supplement has potentiated the humoral response. So then we can conclude that Saccharomyces autolyzed bridge cell wall improved the innate immunity because it did interfered with the neutrocyte and improved the humoral immunity, as we can see by the administration of the vaccine. This attenuated the clinical diseases, but it didn't prevent diarrhea. But the diarrhea had lasted longer and there was less recurrence. And the supplementation, the improvement of immunity also prevented the pneumonia or made them milder with less inflammation indicators and there was a have higher weight gain because, because there was no disease or better use of the nutrients as the intestine was more integral. If we also think about the expenses of the producer, we did not interfere with the protocol. We just told when it should be carried out or not. And the producer used for pneumonia, Kinetomax, that is a long lasting enrofloxacin, once every 72 hours, complementing three administrations. So the drugs cost around seven reals, the protocol, and the control group had to be treated seven times, and the supplemented group had to be treated four times. So we already have savings per treated calf that 8.40 reais. As to dehydration, the owner used this sachet for hydration, Etrafit. It's more expensive than the competitors, but it is very good because it provides supplement of minerals and it has lactose that it becomes a little more exp expensive but the producer considered to have better results and then he would treat these animals at the le least sign of dehydration so when we are going to interfere with the dehydration Sometimes the situation is already very severe. And when we have the destruction of the villi, 
we acted more on prevention and in the control group, they received eight therapeutic sachets and the supplemented group only three based on the dehydration that was seen in 5% of the animals. Based on this, it is more expensive, but results in savings of 70.98 reais. The owner said that two years ago, he had an outbreak of amyriosis in the farm and all the calves died. And only when they were removed from this environment and taken to another region, so we can understand what is stimulating or worsening the immune response of the animal against the disease is a high environmental contamination. And there was no way he could clean the facilities. The only way was to remove the animals. He wanted to do the same during the, the trial, but when he saw that he only lost one or two calves at the beginning of the trial, he was very happy with the results. We talk about the expenses, but we have to mention that rumen yeast has a price. The animals receive 10 grams per day per animal during 36 days. So the rumen yeast group had an expense of 2.80 reais per treatment, showing that although we have to spend a little with the product, but there is a decrease of the disease. There was a decrease in the treatment cost and the results were animals with higher weight gain. This makes the product much more profitable when we make this investment. And with this, I would close my presentation. I'm available for any doubts that you have some pictures of our routine. We have parties, yes, but we work a lot. Immunology with cows or calves. We are always traveling, always looking for new challenges, and I'm available for the doubts you may have. Thank you very much.